Hello, everyone, and welcome to Archeovite. This is uh, officially the fourth video um, in my series on early U.S. Imperial expansion. Now, unofficially, it's the first. However, uh, there are, I recorded a, an introduction video to this series, uh, and there were two previous videos that I had done several months ago that will also be included as essentially the first two parts of the series. So with that in mind, this is officially the third video in the series. So the subject of this video are is the Barbary Wars between the United States and the Barbary States of North Africa. Uh, so right off the bat, when you, you know, I'm sure those of you hearing these terms, uh, the United States of North Africa, the first things that pop into your mind are uh, essentially what you see on the maps here. Uh, the United States, uh, as you see it now in the modern day, with 50 U.S. states, uh, and North Africa, which consists roughly of, uh, not roughly, which consists of uh, countries such as Cairo, uh, sorry, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and the Western Sahara. And of course, this is not an incorrect way to think of these regions. After all, these are these regions have been this way for uh, you know a couple hundred, well, maybe a hundred years or so now, give or take, maybe even only a few decades. But you know they've been that way for a while, and that's how we think of it. But as always, that's not the full picture. The, uh, the U.S. and North Africa only became the ways, the shape, and came to have the political boundaries that they have now after a series of different processes, events, and catalysts. So as always, with that in mind, I like to go back a little bit further in time to get a better look at the overall picture. Which leads us to our first section. So first, we are going to talk about the Barbary states themselves. So the Barbary states uh, were essentially nominal parts of the Ottoman Empire. They were uh, semi-independent uh, city-states and protectorates that gave tribute to the Ottoman Empire, but generally, um, ha you know, were self-governed. Uh, and because of that, uh, they have the Barbary states generally had free reign of uh, their military, and with their military, uh, the Barbary states would actually send out pirates to raid various Christian nations regularly, starting roughly around 1500 uh, and lasting up until 1830 CE, and they would raid fairly far afield. They would raid all the way up to Iceland. They would raid the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, uh, England, Ireland, etc., and even as far west the west as Brazil. Uh, and of course, because they were raiding as far west as Brazil, they would eventually come in contact with uh, the newly independent American ships. So. Uh, <clears throat> In 1777 CE, actually, um, in contrast to their raids against European nations, uh, Morocco, uh, which is sort of the same entity as the Barbary states, but also sort of its own entity, uh, Morocco's Sultanate, uh, Mohammed III, would declare that merchant ships of the new American nation would be under the protection of his Sultanate, and thus could enjoy safe passage into the Mediterranean along the coast, um, which would eventually lead to the successful negotiation of the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship in 1786 CE. A treaty that, as far as I'm a, I am aware, remains unbroken into the modern day, uh, which is very rare for the United States. Uh, however, after the American Revolution, uh, pirates from the city of Algiers and the country of Algiers uh, would begin 
raiding American schooners, uh, mainly at the suggestion of the British Empire. And here's an American schooner here. Uh, and this would happen, start happening roughly around 1785 CE. Because of this, a proposal is given to uh, by uh, various American politicians, including Thomas Jefferson, who was not president yet, um, to put up a coalition of naval warships from the U.S. and other nations that are at war with the Barbary states. Uh, and these various nations that were at war with the Barbary states included nations such as Denmark, Sweden, and Portugal. Um, but all of this was provided that naval operations would be directed specifically against Algerian vessels in particular, uh, upon which they would then impose a maritime blockade on North Africa. However, the resolution would fail to pass Congress due to the proposed financial costs, which would force Congress to allocate $40,000 to free American captives uh, in Algiers. And this would happen in 1791 CE. And here is a map of North Africa with Algiers specifically here. After that, uh, eventually the so-called Naval Act of 1794 would be passed by Congress to establish a defensive fleet with the stipulation in one of his articles that the project would be stopped if an agreement would be finally reached with Algiers. Uh, and as the name implies, this act was passed in 1794 CE. After this, American negotiator Joseph Donaldson would travel to Algiers and would proceed to sign a peace treaty with the Dey, or the uh, sort of governor, uh, prince, etc., uh, uh, satrap. There are various different names you could use uh, uh, over Algiers. Uh, and this treaty would include uh, 22 articles and included an upfront payment of $642,500 uh, in specie or civil, uh, silver coinage for peace, uh, the release of American captives, uh, expenses, and various gifts to the day's royal court and family. Uh, and this would happen in 1795 CE. Uh, and here are some copies of uh, pages from that treaty. Following this, similar treaties would be signed with the city-states of Tripoli in 1796 CE and the city-state of Tunis in 1797 CE. However, only three years after the signing of the treaty with the city-state of Tunis, Dey Mustafa Pasha of Algiers would force U.S. Commodore William Bainbridge, who had been sent uh, to bring uh, some of the tribute to Algiers, uh, to hoist an Ottoman Algerian flag over his warship and then would proceed to force him to sail to Istanbul, carrying a tribute to the Ottoman, to, to the Ottoman Sultanate. And this would happen in 1800 CE. And there is Bainbridge, and there is a picture of the ship, that, the type of ship that Bainbridge would have been on. Uh, just a year after this incident, Thomas Jefferson would be elected president of the United States and would proceed to refuse to pay tribute to the Barbary states because Jefferson was a firm believer that military force rather than endless tribute uh, would be what would it would be what is needed to resolve the threat of the Barbary states. Uh, and again, he was elected in 1801 CE. Uh, and during this period of time, this is generally what the U.S. looked like. So uh, the yellow here is what the territory that the United States held at the point in time. Uh, this area that would eventually become the Louisiana Purchase was still under French possession. Uh, all of this area that would become the American Southwest was still under Spanish possession. And Oregon country was disputed between the West Britain, France, and Spain. But after the election of Jefferson and his refusal to pay tribute to the Barbary states, uh, Yusuf Karmanli, uh, yeah, Yusuf Karmanli, the Pasha uh, of Tripoli, again the sort of governor, ruler, uh, etc., uh, would declare war on the U.S. Uh, and he would do this 
on May 10th of 1801 CE. Here, and here is Yusuf Karmanli, and here is the city of Tripoli. Which leads us to the first Barbary War. After Yusuf Karmanli's declaration of war on the United States, Jefferson and the United States government would order a naval fleet sent to the Mediterranean to wage war on the Barbary states. This naval fleet would be placed on the under the overall command of Richard Dale. Uh, however, other commanders that would become distinguished during this conflict included Stephen Decatur and William Bainbridge, the, uh, the commander who had been uh, forced to bring tribute to the Ottoman Empire by Algiers. The American squadron would then join a Swedish flotilla under uh, Swedish commander Rudolf Sitterstrom uh, in blockading the city of Tripoli. And here is uh, Rudolf Sitterstrom, and here is a picture of the sort of Swedish battleships during that period of time. Uh, after this, another U.S. commander would be sent to the Mediterranean. This would be Edward Treble, who would tra actually travel to the court of Ferdinand IV uh, of the Kingdom of Naples, who would then proceed to supply the Americans with manpower, craftsmen, supplies, uh, gunboats, mortar boats, uh, and would allow them to use the ports of Messina, Syracuse, and Palermo uh, as naval bases to launch operations against Tripoli. And this would all happen on May 31st of 1801 CE. After that, the American Navy would repeatedly, repeatedly defeat Tripolitan fleets uh, and would remain unchallenged on the sea, uh, prompting Thomas Jefferson to send even more ships to the Mediterranean to essentially ramp up the pressure on the city of Tripoli. Uh, with these ships including but being not limited to the USS Argus and the USS Philadelphia, which would allow Preble and, under, and other commanders such as uh, Richard Dale and Decatur to maintain a blockade of the Barbary ports and to execute uh, a campaign of raids and attacks against the city's fleets. Uh, and this would all happen between uh, the middle of 1802 uh, all the way until 1805 CE. And here is the Argus, and here is the Philadelphia. Uh, with these new ships uh, and their new, essentially, forward operating bases uh, in the Italian cities, such as Syracuse and Palermo, the U.S. would eventually be able to uh, deal crushing defeats to the Tripolitan military in battles such as the Second Battle of Tripoli Harbor and the Battle of Dern. With the Battle of Tripoli Harbor happening on July 14th of 1804 CE and the Battle of Derna happening on April 27th to May 13th, 1805 CE. And here is the uh, Triple Battle of Tripoli Harbor and the Battle of Dern. Uh, under the threat of continued advance on Tripoli proper and a scheme to re to restore his deposed brother, older brother, uh, Hamet Karmanli as ruler, Yusuf Karmanli would finally agree to sign a treaty ending the hostilities between Tripoli and the United States on June 10th, 1805 CE. With the treaty having a variety of different stipulations, but the main one I wanted to point out was Article 2, which reads that the Pasha of Tripoli shall deliver up to the American squadron, now off Tripoli, all of the Americans in his possession, and all the subjects of the Pasha of Tripoli, now in the power of the United States of America, shall be delivered to him. Uh, so there was essentially a prisoner exchange. Um, and as the number of Americans in possession of the Pasha of Tripoli amounts to 300 persons, more or less, and the number of tri uh, Tripolitan subjects in the power of the Americans uh, to be about 100, more or less, um, the Pasha of Tripoli shall receive from the United States of America a sum of $60,000 as a payment for the difference between the prisoners herein mentioned. So, as you can see here, 
one of the main concerns for the U.S. military was gaining, uh, was getting uh, prisoners of war back, uh, American prisoners who had been taken uh, prior to and during the war back. Uh, which brings us to just a little bit of an intermission between uh, the U.S. conflicts, uh, between uh, intermission between of conflicts between the U.S. and the Barbary states, uh, and that is the breaking out of war between the United States and the British Empire in the War of 1812. Uh, and during this point in time, the U.S. had get, uh, been purchased the uh, territory known as the Louisiana Purchase, or now Louisiana Territory, uh, doubling its size. Uh, of course, this uh, angered Britain um, and was one of, but not the only, uh, cause that eventually led to the War of 1812. Um, and here is a picture of the British Empire at the end of the War of 1812. During this war, the British fleet, uh, Navy would proceed to blockade the American coast, and it, which would severely limit the number of American ships that could sail to Europe. At that same time, Britain would again turn to the uh, Barbary states, specifically Algiers, uh, and would hire the Barbary pirates as privateers to essentially attack American vessels uh, that were in the Mediterranean Sea uh, and would were upon which their crews would be ransomed to the United States government. Uh, and this would all happen uh, mainly because, again, the uh, British fleet had prevented a, a good chunk of the U.S. fleet from departing and leaving the American coast. However, this would all change when the War of 1812 ended uh, with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, uh, officially in 1814 CE, but there were still some conflicts that were going on in Louisiana and Georgia and Alabama uh, that didn't end until about 1815 CE, and that's because there was no, no like, say, telegraph or anything to um, bring the message of the end of the war quickly. Uh, it had to be brought by, via ship or via overland route, which, of course, was slow. So, with that, with the end of the War of 1812 and the end of the British blockade of the American coast that prevented the American fleet from retaliating against Algiers' uh, seizure of the uh, various, <clears throat> sorry, uh, against Algiers' seizure of the various U.S. ships in the Mediterranean, uh, Congress would then proceed to authorize President James Madison to use the Navy to protect American ships in the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, and adjoining seas. Uh, Congress would also authorize James Madison to grant the U.S. Navy the ability to seize all vessels and goods belonging to Algiers, and this would happen in March 3rd of 1815 CE. And here is James Madison, and there is the American fleet. With this uh, order, with these orders and this permission and authorization, uh, James Madison would send a fleet to the Mediterranean under the command of both Stephen Decatur and William Bainbridge, uh, who would depart and sail for the Mediterranean on May 20th of 1815 CE. After this, uh, and upon their arrival to the Mediterranean, the U.S. Navy would proceed to defeat the Algerian fleet in several battles, such as the Battle off Cape Gata in June 17th of 1816 CE. Uh, and then following that, uh, Omar Aga, the day of Algiers, would then sign a treaty with Decatur, officially ending the Second Barbary War, and permanently ending um, Barbary raids on American ships, while also granting the United States full shipping rights in the Mediterranean uh, on specifically June 19th of 1815 CE. However, it should also be noted that the treaty would not be ratified by the Senate until February 11th of 1822 CE uh, because of some sort of oversight uh, on, the, on the part of the Congress. Um, here is uh, Omar Aga, and there is Decatur's squadron off the coast of 
Algiers. Uh, which now leads us to our last section, the aftermath of the Barbary Wars. So, first off, you might be asking, well, what was the effect of the Barbary Wars on the reputation of the U.S. military? Well, for one thing, the Barbary Wars were very beneficial to the reputation of the United States military. Uh, it's specifically its command and its war mechanism, showing that the United States could execute a war far from home. The Barbary Wars would show that American forces had cohesion to fight together as Americans rather than separately, uh, as uh, specifically like fighting as Georgians or New Yorkers, uh, etc. You know, as uh, as members of some other state. Uh, and also, although the Second Barbary War was very brief and small uh, and small scale, uh, it would actually show the U.S.'s resolve and was seen at the time as a victory for free trade. Now, it is important to note, despite the boost in the U.S.'s reputation, uh, military reputation at the time, the U.S. was still generally seen as a backwater country by great powers such as France and Britain. In fact, for example, in the War of 1812, uh, while if you look on paper, America and, and Britain won uh, the same amount of battles as each other, uh, Britain won the most strategic victories, um, i.e. the you know, they won the most important victories, um, and by and large, suffered less casualties. Then we also need to think about the effect of the Barbary Wars on the United States itself. So after the first Barbary War, Decatur would return to the United States as its first post-revolutionary war hero. As, furthermore, the United States Navy uh, and the United States Marine Corps would become a permanent part of the United States government and, uh, and United States history. Then also, when the United States military efforts in the 19th century were successful against the pirates, uh, partisans of the uh, Democratic Republican Party, not to be mistaken for either the, the Democratic or the Republican Party, this was a sort of a predecessor to both, uh, this party would contrast their president's refusal to buy off the pirates by paying tribute uh, with the failure of the preceding Federalist administration to suppress the piracy. For example, the Federalist policy had previously adopted the slogan, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, but had failed to end attacks on merchant ships. So with that, that ends our uh, the uh, third official and first unofficial video of the uh, of my series on early U.S. imperial expansion. Uh, and as you can see in this video, th this most definitely fits as uh, an early form of U.S. imperial expansion because it involved campaigning, uh, government-sanctioned campaign, military campaigns in a foreign land uh, and to gain some sort of benefit, what, be it land or tribute or increase in reputation. So with that, I hope you all enjoyed the video. And if you'd like to see me cover anything I mentioned in this video in greater detail in later videos, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. And remember to like, share, and subscribe.